Hello. Hello. Everybody, it's 9.02 p.m. Central Time on the 14th of May, 2023. It's Sunday here in the United States, and I hope you are doing well. I am recording, and we are live on Twitch right now while I have an internet connection. And before I get going here in the United States, it is still Mother's Day. So for all the mothers out there, the past, present, and future mothers, happy Mother's Day to you, to my mother, and to all the others that are out there. And that being said, now let's get going into the earthquakes. If you don't know where you're at, well, right now we're looking at earthquakes on Earthquake 3D, the program. And I don't get anything for recommending it. I don't know the creator of it, but I do know that you need a program to look at the earthquakes on the planet three-dimensionally so that you can plot them out and see them. We're using the USGS Geophone Potsdam, the Italian agency, to give us a good broad swath across Europe and Asia and the United States and the Pacific. Now, we're looking at about 48 hours worth of earthquakes right now, and the earthquakes which are high off the planet here are deep down into the earth, so our deep earthquakes are raised high up so we can see them easily. And we have, of course, deep earthquakes on our spots where we have letter Ds. Now, these Ds are already there. We look for deep earthquakes where we have our letter Ds. I don't move the Ds around. The Ds stay in the same spot. We look for deep earthquakes, forecast area points, for these to come up. So I want you to think of these deep earthquakes like somebody lifting on the underside of something. And in this case, the lift is a wave that's coming up through the plates. Now, the wave which is coming up through the plates goes, of course, up through the plates, up, out, and away from where the deep earthquakes are taking place. So we get deep earthquakes down below, like here, for instance, at Fiji on the northeast edge of the Indo-Australian plate. And on the northeast edge of the Indo-Australian plate, then we see a wave spread out down to the south towards New Zealand, over to the west, following the cracks or the boundaries between the plates. So it's like a wave guide or a tank that contains the wave which comes up from down below. So when the wave comes up from down below, we see deep earthquakes first. Then we see shallower, larger earthquakes come up to the surface, towards the surface, and those are the earthquakes where people really feel them. We see them spread out and away from where the deep earthquakes are taking place. Now, about two and a half weeks ago, there was a deep earthquake down below right about here, and it was a deep seven. It was a huge, deep earthquake, which prompted me to issue a warning for a seven-point-something earthquake. 7.5 is what I issued the warning for in the Kermadec Islands, north of New Zealand, south of Fiji, right in here. And a 7.5 struck. It's still on the feed here now. It struck six days ago. So there's the fulfilled forecast for the east side of the plate. Again, that 7.5 already hit. So let me recap. Deep earthquake from two and a half, three weeks ago almost, happened down below right here on the Indo-Australian plate, prompting me to issue a warning over here on the east side of the Indo-Australian plate for a 7.5. 7.5 hit. That hit six days ago. The other spot we're watching is North Japan, all the way up here from Hokkaido north to the Kuril Islands and up into Kamchatka, Russia. Watching for a 7.5, 7 to 7.5 up here. Well, what's happened? Look, Japan has started to move exponentially with a significant amount of earthquake activity. Not just a little bit. So Japan is, let me just zoom in on it, here is the country of Japan. You can barely see it with all the rings over it. So let's just turn down the rings for a second. Look at the spacing on the quakes going across from south of Japan next to Taiwan all the way to north to Kyushu, past all the way to Tokyo, and then further up north to Hokkaido and beyond up into the Kuril Islands. Now you'll notice the earthquakes that are in between are all 5.2 and 5.3. And then we have 6 or a 5.9. And another 6, another 5.9, and swarm of 5s. Now, a swarm is what I consider anything 10 or more earthquakes in a single spot. And this is, again, more than 10 5s in a single spot 
here off the coast of Japan. Now, let me show you where this is happening because this is significant. Let me take you back about a week and a half. Over here on the west side of Japan, where the red line goes over on the left side, here, somewhere right in here, 6.3 to 6.5 earthquake struck with swarm of fours and fives there, and it caused major movement on land, which is pretty rare for Japan. We normally see it out on the coast. So on the left side, or west side of Japan, that's where our 6.5 and outbreak took place. Then, two days later, down here, Okinawa, right where this little island is, right here, another swarm broke out. This is all this week. So first, or this past week, last 7 to 10 days. First up here, then down here, then four days ago, down here at Philippines, right at the bend of the plate, another outbreak took place, which we can all see here right now if I take us back for the last five to six days. There it is. So now when you look at it, what you'll see, the red-colored earthquakes are from this past week, and it goes down off the coast of Taiwan, down into the Philippines, and notice each set of quakes is connected between by 5.2s and 5.3s. And now this is that wave that I'm talking about coming up and spreading out. Think of these like waves in an ocean equally spaced out as they're spreading out across an area, but then they reflect into themselves. Now, this gets us into the middle point here. This middle point, look on the north side, see the red and white colored earthquake, and see down to the south, the red and pink colored earthquakes. This all happened in the last several days. The big break in the middle of it all, wouldn't you say? In the middle of what? In the middle of this. From Taiwan and Philippines, all the way up here to Kamchatka, this the H-shape plate boundary is the middle. It's indisputable. That is the rough middle point of all that. Now, that's also connected across by another plate boundary. And so, let's get back to the earthquakes. This all happened today. This is the final response of the rest of the plate shifting all up and down. Now, I'm looking for a 7 to 7.5 to break out here at the north side. All the way up here. It hasn't happened yet. I'm not canceling the warning for it in light of what happened today down here along the plate boundary. Let me take you back in time to 2011. 2011, March 9th, 2011. Two and a half, three days, let's just say, before the big earthquake in Japan. There was a 9.0 earthquake on March 11th here right off the coast of Japan. Now, before that, on March 9th, a 7.2 earthquake struck here at the Bay of Tokyo, or the harbor, right there at the H-shaped plate boundary. A 7.2 struck there on the 9th, a smaller earthquake. It sent a small wave into the harbor, about two feet high. Nobody even really paid attention to the wave. The skyscrapers swayed in downtown Tokyo, and everybody said they're earthquake prepared and that they're used to big earthquakes, and it didn't really mean much. This is March 9th. I made a video on March 9th, the night of, after the 7.2 struck, and this... Something like this was going on. Something like this. This big swarm of earthquakes here off the coast of Japan. So the 7 had already happened, and an outbreak of 5s then took place in a big round cluster around where the 7 happened, and everybody called them aftershocks. I made a video, and I showed that the earthquakes were then, at that point, going from the big circle of earthquakes around where the 7 happened, and they were starting to spread in a line going from down here towards up here, towards North Japan. So it was 7.2, cluster of fives, then a stepping stone path of interconnected fours and fives, hundreds of them, or well, dozens of them, going up the coast in the course of a day. Thus my video. And as I saw the spread taking place, I made the video saying, looks like something bigger is going to happen in Japan. This is March 9th of 2011. This is my first earthquake forecast. It's very primitive. Something bigger. Something bigger than what? Something bigger than the 7.2 that had happened and the swarm of fives. The swarm of fives was a sign of the plate shifting, right? I mean, it's now looking back, obvious. So first there was a break, 7.2. Then there was a spread, or a cluster of fives. Then there was a spread of fives. Then there was the big nine up the coast, up here off the coast of Honshu and Fukushima. So now what's going on? Well, 
the whole thing is broken with fives and sixes all the way up to North Japan and back down in the middle is where the big break is taking place. There is no spread of fives yet, but I'm looking for that. I'm looking very close to see if there will be a spread of earthquakes that goes out from this to the north or to the south or even to the east slightly, but I would think either north or south. If that takes place, then I will start to look for the potential of a very large earthquake to strike in Japan proper as opposed to what I'm looking for now, which is still looking for a 7 to 7.5 to strike on the north side of here. Why am I looking for a 7 on the north side? Well, first of all, the whole plate shifted at the Indo-Australian plate. We already got our 7.5 on the east side of it, and I think all the way transferring to the north, we'll see on the northwest side of the Pacific plate, Another compensation quake has not happened yet, but all this other stuff taking place really raises my antenna for Japan to the north from Tokyo, where the H-shaped plate boundary is, to the north, all the way into the Kuril Islands. Okay, so I hope that sums it up. Let's just, let me just put it simply. We're looking for a big earthquake north of Japan still, but the potential exists in Japan if we see a spread for a very large earthquake in Japan itself. And when I say very large, I mean like, well, where are we now? We're at a bunch of fives and a 5.9. We would take it up by two magnitudes or three magnitudes. Two magnitudes would take it up to 7.9. That would be huge in its own right if it struck on land. And three magnitudes would put it on the level of the March 2011 earthquake, which was 9.0. I mean, eight, what's the difference between an 8.9 and a 9? One eight. One 8.0 earthquake is the difference between an 8.9 and a 9. So it's like adding on another eight, basically. I mean, it, it's, there is a big difference, but that being said, I think still we're going to look on the north side. That's why I'm not canceling the warning. I think it's going to break on the north side. I think all this shifting that's happening here is a sign of the plate shifting, of course, and the plate is shifting from the Indo-Australian plate down here to the south, where back to where I started this update, all the deep earthquakes are coming up from down below, pushing up on the underside of the plate, now, we have another warning going, and this is separate from all the others, and this is something we definitely have to watch for, which is 8.0 level activity here next to the Solomon Islands and north of New Zealand. And the reason we're looking for that is our 7.5 was at 200-something kilometers deep. This 7, which struck on the 10th four days ago, not six, four days ago, when this hit, we then watch for 7 to 10 days for a potential of a shallower, larger earthquake than 7.5. How much larger? Up to one magnitude larger potential. It doesn't mean we're going to go all the way up to 8.5, but it means there's the potential for it to go up to 8.5. Anywhere between 7.5 and 8.5. Next to where this deep earthquake is. Now, next to is kind of tricky because we're on a pinnacle tip of what looks like a triangle or an arrow. So which way is it going to go? Which way is the wave going to come up and go? There's no way for me to know ahead of time which way the wave is directed. Is it going to come straight up and then spread out? Is it coming up at an angle? Did the break happen down below at the bottom of the plate at an angle or something? Is it going to come up over to the west, following the arrows to the west, or is it going to come up going down to the south? It's literally at the pinnacle point. In this case, it's going to go all three directions, like a river splitting across a three-pronged fork. So if this was one river coming up, when it comes up, it has three ways to go. Down towards New Zealand, over to the west towards New Caledonia and Solomon Islands and so forth, and over to the east, all the way to Central and South America. Now, I think, and this is what I've issued the warning for, when it comes up, before it spreads out, that's where our big earthquake's going to hit. So we watch here next to the big, deep earthquake for a big earthquake, a very large earthquake, one of the biggest in years for the whole planet to take place in the next 7 to 10 days here. But this up in Japan is just something we have to keep an eye on to see if it spreads. If this spreads in Japan, then we watch for a potential of a large earthquake in Japan. In addition to the 7 point something that we're looking for up here, which I would cancel. If Japan gets hit with the large earthquake, then I, of course I will cancel the warning up here just north of Japan where I've been looking. Okay, so it's a lot to take in, guys. Let me just kind of like simplify this for any new viewer. A bunch of new deep earthquakes have taken place because of solar activity, which I haven't even mentioned yet. 
the solar activity is leading to our deep earthquake activity. And then the deep earthquake activity, shallower, larger earthquakes then come up and spread around the planet. And so after a solar storm, a few days after, we start to see this. Big deep earthquake activity. Then, following stuff like this, then we see big breaks come up between where all the current earthquakes are taking place. You see a big spread across half the West Pacific in a day and a half. You know that there's going to be a big break in the middle of it all. And what I call the hot mess in the middle of the hot mess is where the break takes place. Now, speaking of a hot mess and breaks taking place, how about the United States? Should we talk about the U.S. next or should we go to Europe? I mean, in Europe, we could just talk about a little bit of activity, but I'm going to talk about the United States. Everybody contacting me in regards to the earthquake hitting up in Northern California. Now, I'm not bragging or anything. I just have to tell the new viewers in case you don't know. Well, here, actually, instead of telling you, maybe I should show you. I'll take you over to my YouTube page. Go back nine days. Here we are, nine days ago and 13 days ago. These three videos, including the fires, talking about nine days ago with the fires. In these videos, we issued a warning for Northern California for a 5.5 earthquake in Swarm. And I warned Eureka here, right along the coast. The reason I warned for a 5.5 was because 5.5s were going around the rest of the planet nine days ago, and this was the last spot that we had warned and the last spot to be hit. So check it off the list. It was struck by a 5.5, a 5.3, and now a 5 and a 5.1. So three to four separate earthquakes struck in the last two days, and we are 130 miles east of Eureka. I'm trying to get it down to 200 miles. If I get it within 200 miles, I consider that a direct earthquake forecast hit. In this case, it's the first five to come into California in many months' time. I think it's been two or three months. So to get it down to a few days, I'm pretty pleased with that. I'm going to pull the coordinates on this. We'll get it from the USGS. It says it's at Canyon Dam, California. And we're going to go look it up, show you where it is in, in relation to where we warned. Again, I try to get it within 200 miles, so... We're at 130 or so miles east of Eureka, so that's definitely an earthquake forecast hit. For anybody who said earthquakes couldn't be forecast, well, I mean, called for a f first in months, 5.5, struck 100 miles east of where I warned. So here is Eureka. Earthquake epicenter in Lake Alamanor, right here. And so that is, oh, did I say 130? 166 miles from this latest 5.1. The other struck on the other side of Lake Almanor two days ago. Whatever. You'll notice all the volcanoes here. So zooming in, we have, of course, Mount Lassen, the stratovolcano here. And that's the most well-known. If you don't know about Mount Lassen, just go ahead and pause it and read it if you need to. Of course, that's assuming you can read it on the small screen that you might be looking on. Or big screen, we never know. Now look at the volcanic fields around here. Some of these are huge shield volcanoes. Others are small cinder cones. Let me show you an example. Here's Cinder Cone Butte State Park. And those are, of course, lava flows that go down to the lake there. Not even covered in trees. Goes back up, of course, to the spatter cone, cinder cone there. Pretty cool looking. Okay, well, that's just one of hundreds, would you say? And some, again, are many, many, many miles wide. Shield volcanoes, others are, again, small. But it's across a huge, huge volcanic field. We're right on the side of there. Now, you also notice where we are in relation to, I don't know, let's just say Oroville and Paradise. We're on the east side of Paradise. We're right here, right? Now, I'm going to turn off everything. We're going to go and look at something which I've showed my viewers hundreds and hundreds of times at this point. Turn off every border and label. Every place mark, we're going to back it out. Here's Lake Tahoe. Here's Pyramid Lake for reference. Of course, here's the northern part of the valley. Now, of course, you know about Lake Tahoe, or maybe you've heard about it. It's an extremely deep folded basin on one side of this. See, nobody references this. This here in the middle is something I had to find myself as earthquakes struck around the outside edge of it. 
earthquakes keep striking around the outside of this thing in a ring shape. Then, fires started breaking out around the edge of this thing. And that's what drew my eye to it, the earthquakes and the fires. Once I got all the place marks for the volcanoes, it started to make a little bit more sense. It's lined with its own volcanoes, smaller buttes and cones. Now, this is an oval shape lined with volcanoes, hit with earthquakes around the outside edge in an oval shape. Fires break out around this thing, and it's huge, and it's ovular, ovular, ovular. Now, that sounds familiar because down here on the California-Nevada border, this is the super volcano that professionals tell us about called Long Valley Caldera. It's lined with volcanoes. It gets hit with earthquakes around the outside edge in an oval shape around the outside of the caldera. It gets fires breaking around this thing, and they try to blame it on this and that for people and arson and all kinds of stuff. Now, notice this is actually smaller the one that professionals acknowledge, the super volcano with a thousand cubic kilometers of melt down below it, the one they acknowledge is smaller than this big one up here that they don't acknowledge. So I had to find this myself and I named it Mount Dutch version 2.0 and then we renamed it Kaz's Caldera because one of my viewers is an earthquake researcher, Casimirio there, lives right there. So Kaz's Caldera, guess what? Fires break out next to these things. Let's go down to the south and show you. See this? Again, that's the one that the professionals acknowledge. That's Long Valley Caldera. Right across from Long Valley Caldera, let me zoom in and show you, is this. This giant dome-like feature that's here. here, And this place is called Coarse Gold, California. See, it's Coarse Gold. I'm going to turn off the labels just so you can see what I'm talking about. This is a bulge in the plate in the east side of the valley, a giant dome-like bulge. It's on the other side of the supervolcano. A lacolith has formed here, a bulge in the plate from magma intruding down below. It shouldn't erupt ever. These are bulges that happen over miles. But guess what breaks out around this all the time? Fires. Now, two days ago, a fire broke out here. They got it out pretty quick. I don't know what they blamed it on, but it keeps happening there over and over again. It's happened for six years every year, multiple times per year. It doesn't matter whether it's quote-unquote warm or cold, whether it's raining or not. Enough so that that's what drew my eye to this. That's how I found this. The fires and the earthquakes also go to it as well. The earthquakes and the fires both drew my eye to this. That's how I found it. I found it this one. And there's another one right down here that's collapsed. This one. This one is collapsed or receded or hardened off or cooled off. But this one also had earthquakes around it. This one also got a few fires around it. But uh, the coarse gold one is the one that I've shown for six years. I've showed it here over and over again. Just got a fire next to it in the past couple days. So why does that matter if a fire breaks out next to coarse gold? Well, it's at the same time that Northern California starts to break. Now, what's going on? There's another series of earthquakes down to the southwest now breaking out, a swarm breaking out at a place called Geyserville, California. They have it listed as Cobb, California now, but I'm going to zoom in on it and we'll show you. Geysers, California, or Geyserville, depending on which way you go. There we go. There's Geyser Peak Volcano. Here's Clear Lake Volcano. Here's the earthquake epicenter. And right next to it, you're going to see something like this. You see these pipelines? These are drill points. They inject water down into the ground at some of these pipes. And then they take other pipes, I don't know which pipes do which, and take the steam from that to these turbines. And the turbines then provide electricity to the area. They're getting the heat from in the ground at the Clear Lake Volcanic Field in Geyser Peak next to Geyserville here. Oh, by the way, let me turn the... Borders and labels back on. There we go. There's Geyserville. And that's where our other outbreak is taking place. Now you'll notice the other earthquakes which are striking are striking where? They're striking all around the oval shape. I just turned on everything 0, 0.0 and greater. You'll see we're going up north of Pyramid Lake. And we're going down south here just north of Lake Tahoe. There's something at north side of Pyramid Lake. And there's something south down here just north of Lake Tahoe, something at both spots. 
So I just showed you the oval shape, just showed you the outbreak and the fives taking place on the west side of the oval shape is also where the fires have taken place. And I told you there's something on the north side of Pyramid Lake, something on the north side of Lake Tahoe. Let's go look at the north side of Lake Tahoe first. There it is. Steamboat Springs, marked Smithsonian Volcanic Field. And look what's there. A boatload of geothermal pumping operations. Drill points going down hundreds of feet, maybe, or maybe even a few thousand. And they're injecting water to get steam to turn the turbines. And they have them all over here. Look how many turbines they've got. It's a huge geothermal field. Okay. That's what's on the north side of Lake Tahoe right there where the earthquakes are breaking out going around this thing. Now, on the north side of Pyramid Lake, it's a reservation. And they have not exploited this. These are the tufa deposits from the large geothermal field. So the needles at Pyramid Lake are what those are called, by the way, and it's a geothermal field on the north side. Now, we're equally spaced on both sides of this giant oval shape. Two folded basins on either side filled with water. Geothermal basins, folded basins, lined with volcanoes, hit with earthquakes and fires around the outside edge. It's a giant ancient supervolcano, guys. That's what it is. Let me get a sip of my coffee while you consider that. And then you consider the fires which break out to the left side or west side of each one of these. There, here at Long Valley, over at Coarse Gold. Down to the south, there's one more that I have not told you about that's hidden in the mountains. And these are all volcanoes making up the outside edge of Golden Trout Creek, Red Hill Volcano, Templeton Mountain, and Monash Mountain. Making an arc-like shape around one side of it. Oh, and a giant bulging collapsed lacolith here in the plate and then on the other side we have one that we have marked but it again here now why am i showing that to you all the fires that broke out where here at camp nelson where's camp nelson there it is here's camp nelson all the fires that broke out there so we get big fires breaking out on the left side or west side of this of this and of this, the supervolcanoes. It's indisputable. People told me it was just chance. That was six years ago. The chance thing. Now, there's a line of earthquakes that goes from the fives and the threes and the swarms down along the California-Nevada border. And go look, look where it goes to. It goes right down next to the other supervolcano I just showed you. And I'm going to prove that to you. I don't expect you to believe me. See where it says Mina, Nevada? Mina, Nevada? Here, let me show you, because showing is half the battle. There we are. Okay, Monte Cristo Hills Volcanic Center is where the 6.5 and swarm struck two years, three years ago. A crack formed in the ground, a surface fissure fracture. Actual crack in the ground formed. Went over to the west, all the way across the highway, and went over towards these old, well, don't know what to make of them. We won't even go into it right now. Went into just these old pit mines and quarries that exist out here. And then we didn't hear much about it after the crack formed. Well, after the crack formed, of course, the energy escaped out. And that was a few years ago. But we go right down next to this. This is the super volcano. The other volcanic centers around it are expected. Around the super, I mean, again, like around Yellowstone, you expect next to Yellowstone in the Snake River Plain to have a line, of, a line of volcanoes that spreads out from it. Well, same thing with this. This is the confirmed supervolcano now. This is Long Valley Caldera, the one that the professionals acknowledge. So this line of earthquakes goes from the one supervolcano down and right next to it, about the same distance, and then down to this one. Now you'll notice the trajectory of the earthquakes. The wave is coming in and going down further into Nevada. What's down here? Nuclear. Nuclear. How do you say it? Nuclear. New clear. N E W C L E A R. Say it like that. New clear. That's how you say it. <laughs> Why am I talking about nukes? Well, we're not doing nukes there now. This is where they did the past nuclear test, where they made a bunch of man made faults. This is Doomtown, Operation Rise Line. 
Let me turn on the Google Earth community. It's taken a long, painstaking time to mark all these. Operation Rise Line in Doomtown, U.S. Nuke Operation Able. Now, all of these are underground nuke test sites, and I show this all the time because it keeps getting hit. This is a destination for the wave before it goes over to the east and spreads out following this trajectory over to Colorado. We go across North Arizona. So we go down to the nuke test sites. And again, like I said, these are all underground nuke sites. U.S. Nuke Operation Pajara, December 12, 1973, 20 kilotons. Just one of hundreds of underground tests there. There's even more that go out around the area up here and down here like I just showed you. Okay, now, jumping out of the nuke sites, we have one lone quake over to the east and another one over in Colorado. We're spreading across the Craton. Then we go down to Texas, back up to Oklahoma, over to Missouri, where we have a rare earthquake in central Missouri, which we're going to talk about all this. But before we get into any of that, I want to go look up this lone quake up here in northwest Arizona. Scenic, Arizona. Scenic. Wow. I bet it is. I bet there's a lot to see here. Let's go see. Shall we? Let's to take a gander together. There we go. Oh, wow. Past earthquake location. Just small. June 3rd, 2015. It's rare. We hardly ever get earthquakes in these areas. Only when there's a big push coming across. What's that? Wow. I wouldn't know what to make of that. I mean, it looks like a well that's going to feed a pond of some kind. Now, if there were any more in these areas, I would think maybe that we were talking about some kind of pumping operation that was nearby. Are there any more? New Spring, there is. Look, there's another one here nearby. Okay, so we have water features coming up out of the ground here. I'm not surprised. Look, we're right next to uh, what, I mean, you know, edges of what you would call the Grand Canyon, right? So I'm not surprised to see there's water in the ground here. Now, backing it out, though, look what we have next to us. We have Dutchman's Draw. Yeah, right, the name. C. Miller Butte, Wolf Hole Mountain, Hat Knoll, and the Yuen Karet Volcanic Field. Here is the Yuen Karet. Now, it's ancient. This is way older than the other volcanoes I was just showing you. I mean, look, it's covered in trees. It's barely visible. But this is marked from the Smithsonian, so you guys are welcome to pause it and read it. It's on the edge of the Grand Canyon. But as we go on the north side up here, you'll see the edges of the old lava flows. This is a plateau that was formed from lava flows. So look how much lava flowed on this. It was insane, right? Now you can see there's smaller buttes that form their own plateaus. Well, these are now plateaued, but these were lava flows that have been blasted away over time. Hat Knoll. This one, look at that. Okay, anyway, you, you get the picture for how old these are. And then we jump over here, we have more. But we're on the edge of a giant ancient volcanic field, and there's there's more over here. The, I, this one doesn't even have a name on it. Look. You can still see the cone on it. Let me turn it at a side angle. I mean, you can still see it there, and there's a chain of them. Look at that. Wow. A chain of ancient volcanoes there. Look, here's a road street level, so that lets you know how big those are. You can drive there. Don't do that. You're out in the middle of the desert. But Okay, anyway, it's a, it's a huge line of volcanoes right there at the earthquake epicenter. But what these are, just like the nuke test sites, they're not doing nukes there now. This wave that I've been talking about, let's go back and look. Guys, there's a wave coming down from the supervolcano, going to the supervolcano, going over to Volcanic Field, and then we head over to the edge of the North American Craton over to Colorado. Now, Craton matters. I'm going to have to make a shirt that says that. Craton matters. Craton comes from the Greek word. Come on, class, say it with me if you know what it is. Kratos! It means strong like ox. Okay. Like bear. <laughs> 
The, do I have your attention now? Guys, the earthquakes are flowing from California over to the edge of the Graton. Remember that, because professionals said it was impossible. They said it was impossible and said I was faking the quakes to make it look like it. That was 10 years ago. And here we are, 10 years later, and it's happening on a daily basis. Let's go over to Weston, Colorado. Go over on the edge of the Craton. And go, not crouton. No, you don't put this on your salad. It's spelled differently. What's over here in Colorado, Dutch? Oh, I don't know. What are those? Come on, give me your best Jake Paul impersonation. What are those? Points down at the ground. Oil wells, dude. Oil and gas. Fracking. Fracking. Now look how many there are. These are all different drill points here in southern Colorado. This is the New Mexico border. Look, we go right across the border. Make a run for the border. Right on the other side, more oil wells. And we go on and on and on and on. And we don't stop. Okay, anyway, uh, here we are at Trinidad, southern Colorado. Now, let's get back to that Craton diagram and the earthquakes. So we come down the California-Nevada border in a diagonal line of quakes. Volcano to volcano to volcano to volcano to nuke site to volcano to drill point. Then we go down here and we get the same size quake. Three? Three. What's down in Texas? What's down in West Texas? You've been the heart of Texas. Come on, guys. Sing along with me. Let's go see what's down in the heart of Texas. Well, this isn't the heart. There's a wing of Texas. Look at that. I feel sorry for anybody who tries to come in through down the south. They're going to they're like, this is the United States. It looks like Mordor. <laughs> Literally, you come down here. You're like, I'm going to come into the United States. You come walking in. You look off in the distance in all directions. It's microwave towers and, and oil wells. That's no exaggeration, really. That's what you're seeing here. So anyway, a thousand million drill points. And that is no exaggeration. There's probably a billion drill points overall. But they would never tell us. But I'll tell you, when you start getting numbers like this, this is just one Texas county. A thousand millions a billion, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Getting real nerdy on you guys. I'm sorry, man. What time is it? 9.39? It's not even that late. All right. There we go. So, line of earthquakes goes over to Colorado, down to Texas, back up to Oklahoma, Kansas. Now, up in Kansas, these are... 1950s and 1960s oil fields. There's nothing for me to show you on Google Earth. The only reason I know this is because I had to use the Kansas oil well map lookup, and I'm not going to do it now to bore you. Uh, you have to take my word for it. I've showed you all the rest. Do I need to show you Oklahoma? It's well established on Oklahoma and the earthquakes in Oklahoma. Um, in case you don't know about the drill points in Oklahoma, 500,000 or more, and every single one of these earthquakes in Oklahoma is directly next to a drill point like what I just showed you in Texas. So just to save you some time, when we look them up in Oklahoma, it's a big farm field with those oil pumps in them, just like down in Texas. But over here in Missouri, it's a slightly different thing going on. I want to see what it is. A surface earthquake, is it? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Now, why wouldn't, man, I'll tell you what. See this? See this? Look. See the name of the place? Fort Leonard Wood. Dude, it's a military earthquake. Fort Leonard Wood's where they're doing all the uh, uh, army training. They do a bunch of army training down here at Fort Leonard Wood. We're at the town. Actually, the nearest town is called Laclede. Interestingly enough, I could tell you a whole story on Laclede, but not now. I'd like to put the earthquake in on Google Earth and just see what's next to Fort Leonard Wood, even though they list it as a surface earthquake. I'll think it's a blast from the Army, right? Maybe there's something else here. Maybe there's some reason the earthquake struck here. Something interesting nearby, a river. That's not going to be causing the earthquake, is it? But I would think the Army artillery ranges across the way would 
Are there are no no those are civilian. Look, there's roads there. Is there anything else I need to know about here near? Oh, well, wow. Hey, hold on. We've got the power lines that go back to our nuclear power plant back up in Fulton, up in northern Missouri. I wonder if there's anything else here worth mentioning next to Fort Leonard Wood. Oh, wait, that's right. That's right. Well, I don't want to go too far off the rails, but I will just show you. Down here in southern Missouri, this is six miles by nine miles, and these are foothills. Okay. Now, this is in a specific shape. It looks like a diamond. I'll draw it for you in case you don't know what I'm talking about. Six, nine miles long. I'm just rough measuring. It's nine by six. Okay. Now, what this is, you see that? Now, that's made of the mountains itself. This is in clear-cut forestry. These are actual foothills in this shape, in the shape of one portion of a star fort. In case you don't know what a star fort is, it's in the shape of a bastion fort. But this is six by nine miles in size. Now, this is southern Missouri. Here is the town of New Madrid. Here is a six by nine mile wide star fort made of mountains going up hundreds of feet. Now, why am I showing this to you? What does that have to do with the earthquake out there in central Missouri? We're going to back it out now. There's the earthquake in central Missouri. Now, look. There's another one next to it. I'll show it to you. I'll draw it out for you. This is not paradelia. This is really, there's something here. Let me show it to you. So we're going to measure this. We're going to measure from back here. These are foothills again to up here, to the city. What city is that? That's Springfield, Missouri. Now, right next to it is Fort Leonard Wood, right here. This is Fort Leonard Wood. This? I can turn on my place marks if you need me to. See? Fort Leonard Wood. And this is their whole training area right in here. Okay. Now, why am I doing this? Why am I drawing this line here to show you? Over here on this side, going over in this direction, same thing, and it brings us back down into St. Louis. Now, I live right along through here. Now, the, it's the same distance from here to here. Now, this carries through to the Cahokia Mounds on the other side of the river from St. Louis, right through the mounds, right here. And I'm, I'm roughly drawing it for you. Again, I'm just doing it so you can see it. It goes out through the mounds down here to the south, and down here to the south, it gets washed out by the Mississippi River Valley. So, let's recap. This, oh, comes back down this way. And again, I'm roughly drawing it for you guys, but you get the picture. This thing here has the military base built right in the eye of it. And out at the front of it is a city, Springfield, Missouri. Now, this one is one-fourth. of this one. This one is 300 miles long, and it too is in the five-sided bastion fort shape. Here is the New Madrid seismic zone, broken apart on one side with its six mile by nine mile long mini one on the side of it, and this one is mega huge. It's 300 miles long from the back side here where the Cahokia Mounds are, going right from the river, out through the front tip. Now, going around the outside edges of it, it's pretty obvious that this thing was an ancient something or other a long time ago. And 300 miles or so long, it's two, what, 215? And I'm measuring in miles, whatever measurement system they used thousands of years ago when they built this thing. Now, we've built cities on all five sides of it, letting you know on one side of it's been destroyed, the New Madrid Seismic Zone down here. But we have St. Louis here. Here, let me bring this back north now that you know what you're looking at. We have St. Louis here. We have Kansas City here. We have Spring or Columbia, Missouri here. Down here, going through the middle of it, or roughly through the middle of it. We have Fort Leonard Wood here in the middle of that, right here in the middle of the eye of it. And it's pointing this way. You can draw a line from the back side of it this way out through the middle of it like a giant arrow and it brings you down to 
there, wouldn't you say? And it could be anywhere along through here. And if we go through the center of it, brings you down through this. The weird underwater feature that they all tried to say was some kind of underwater bathymetric measurement error. And it turns out it's actually been measured now and it's 200 foot to 300 foot mounds and depressions that have been carved out 5,000 feet down in the ocean. And it leads back to that. But why am I taking the time to show any of this to you? The military base. They're, they're, it's one inside the other. It's like nested. It's a fractal. One, two, three. And there's a fourth one. There's a fourth bigger one. You want to see it? There it is. It's kind of hard to see. On one side, you got Florida. On the other side, you've got Nunavut going up off the east coast of the United States. One side's still intact, submerged. The other side's blown out with a crater. That's off Newfoundland. It's a giant triangle. One side, you got Alaska. The other side, you got Mexico. Half of it's been blown out across the center. You zoom in on the center. You've got this thing built in in the center. And then you got this one built on the side of it. How do I find any of this? Earthquake strike below the tips of all of them. It's the only way I found earthquakes. Or the, the only way I found them is the earthquakes have struck down below these things. You might say I'm paradealing it, but how do you explain the military bases and the earthquakes? How do you explain the military bases? When I say bases, we have other locations that also do the same. So I got a little off track, but not too far, because I have to tell you about all that to show you the earthquake there that's striking down below Fort Leonard Wood or on the surface that's listed as an earthquake, not as a blast. Let's go over to California and wrap this sucker up. So I've already covered the line of quake. Are, are you sufficiently mind-numbingly mind-blown by any of that? Who could build a 300-mile-long thing made out of mountains, guys? Pre-flood. Pre-flood. This is, this is ancient stuff. This is stuff that, that 300 miles long would be like very low frequency of some kind. We'd be talking about wireless energy transfer. Not a bastion fort. A bastion fort holds cannons and sh for shooting arrows. Unless the cannons are the size of Manhattan. So there's a line of earthquakes. A wave that goes down, over, over, down, up, back, over. It's being directed. This wave is being directed. And it's following the edge of the North American Craton. Now, what about along the coast? Well, I already showed you the volcano up here at Clear Lake. And now that a five has struck up here in Northern California, we have to warn Southern California for a new outbreak. The creeping section has started to creep. We're southeast of Monterey Bay. We have a new outbreak going up into the near 3.0 range. Big cluster of quakes there. We get down to here and we stop. On the San Andreas, the rest of the activity carries up, carries on down to the south, which we'll talk about in a second. Look what's going on down south, just south of the border. Multiple fours and threes going right up to the border down next to San Diego. But here, let's go take a look. We are going down the San Andreas, down to Parkfield, the earthquake capital of the world, as they call themselves. Pull the coordinates, go put them in. We're stopping next to a bunch of drill points. In California. Drill points along the San Andreas of all things. Can you believe it? Well, Parkfield, of course, doesn't have the drill points. All the drill points are right here. They start here and go all the way down following the San Andreas. Drilled out all the way up to it, right down to it, down to the south. All of this drilled. Do you want to see it? Here, I'll, we'll start up to the north. Starting up to the north, let me just zoom in. Okay, you're going to see just miles and miles of pipeline and drill points and, of course, jacks of the pumps, the shadows of the jacks you can see. And you see how big that is. And we have hundreds there, and then we go down, and by this time we're getting to thousands. And that's just right through here. Once we go down here, we get into these. And the whole mountain range is done this way. Go down through the mountain range here, across what's called Missouri Triangle of all things. This is the San Andreas right next to us. Just so here's San Andreas. Here's our drill points. Drill points go down through here.
and carry on, and they've done whole mountain ranges this way. Well, the whole desert. This is not a well storage yard for jacks and pumps to be stored at. Those are all drilled. And then all of this. This is what a hillside used to look like. This is what it looks like after they come in, scrape out a pad, and do a drill point. And then you see they've done the whole mountain range this way. Those aren't sand dunes. Those were old gullies and hilltops that they scraped off for the whole mountain range. So now I just showed you drill points going all the way down, and we go right up to the San Andreas with our drill points. So somebody somewhere a long time ago knew that there's a wave that's coming down, and when you drill along that, or perforate along that area, guess what? The wave goes down to the drill points or to the perforation point and then jumps off and is guided by the drill points. That's what's happening over in Texas. That's what's happening in Colorado on the edge of the Craton. So our earthquakes are coming down the San Andreas. We get to here and we're stopping. But then we're picking back up down here to the south. What's going on? Well, look at the connection. In between, down at the southeast side of the valley, the whole Garlock Fault is lit up with activity. L.A. Basin, north of it. L.A. Basin, south of it, with quiet in L.A. itself. South of the border, like I said, threes, fours, and a line of quakes, another diagonal line. How many, are we, how many diagonal lines is that? One along the California-Nevada border going northwest to southeast, then going over to the east. Another along the California-Nevada border, right, northwest to southeast. And lo and behold, another one, just like the other one. So the only oddball out is this line of quakes going the opposite direction completely. And let me take you back over to the USGS map. We'll zoom in on Southern California. I will turn on the faults. And there it is. The Garlock Fault. You see it? It goes the opposite way than all the others. Now all the others are flowing like a river. The faults themselves, they're all pointing in a certain direction. You can see which way this all funnels in on the supervolcano, and then it spreads to the south, right? Again, you see which way they're all pointing, or most of them. Looks like a funnel coming down into here. But then we get down here, and we're lit up across this going down north of L.A. So what's going on? This wave is coming down to here, and it's jumping over to here. Then it's going down the gar line and carrying on down this way bypassing all the drill points because it's really following the drill points on the north side. You don't see an earthquake in the valley there because the wave is jumping across. It's hitting over here on this side. Coming down, hitting over. Then it goes down into L.A. So what's going on out here in north L.A.? Well, what's north of L.A.? Anybody know? Let's go out and pull an earthquake from in the middle of the little line of quakes there. Piru. Piru, 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 California. Piru. What is there? Is there anything worth looking at? I think I've got everything turned on that we would need to see. Ah, oh, look, hold on. Is this an explosion of some kind? It's 0 0.6 kilometer depth. Hold on. But they don't have it listed as a quarry blast. That's pretty darn interesting. Oh, wait. Hold on. Look what we have here. Next to the quarry. Black gold. Black gold, guys. More oil. That's oil. That's not fracking. All right. Oil pumping operation. We got an earthquake at an oil pumping operation directly at one. All right. Glad I checked. Wow. I'm just glad I checked. wonder what's over to the east. Santa Clarita, California. Let's go see. What's in Santa Clarita? Over to the east we go. Looks like we're going into a residential subdivision area. Oh, wow. Look at the power lines there. Huge sets of transmission lines. One, two, three sets of transmission lines right there. Well, we know the transmission line thing and the earthquake connection. We know about all that. I wonder if there's anything else here nearby. Let's zoom in and see. Uh, 
Nice houses. Right behind... What is that? What is this place? Looks like some kind of quarry or mine. That's what it looks like. Usually when you see something like that, you've got some kind of quarry. What's this? Massive electrical substation. Oh, God. Okay, so we got the massive electrical. We've got the big power lines. I'm not seeing any drill points here nearby. I have to do a visual inspection to see. that. Look. Look. How, oh, my God. Look. Look, they're crossing. There's multiple... Cr the scalar on this would be insane. Crossing a very low frequency. Multiple waves crossing. Can we see it? They don't have a street level for it. That's... Some of the that's one of the biggest junctions I think I've ever seen of power lines. I'm surprised they don't have a view of it that there's no street level. On both sides we're going into valleys. Oh. God, could you imagine looking out to that? Wonder if anybody there is feeling sick. They're like, so-and-so, these houses keep flipping. We, you know, people, people keep moving out. Uh, so-and-so died and keep dying. Everybody got sick. Don't know why. Look at that. Dear God. Okay, so in case you don't know, what about the earthquake and power line connection? And scalar? Yeah, well, first of all, I could lecture for hours on scalar and the power lines and earthquakes and the connection between very low frequency. Very low frequency in the power lines and very low frequency traveling through the plate. The wave that I've been talking about through this whole update is very low frequency. The spacing on the earthquakes, hundreds of miles apart. Very low frequency, ultra low frequency type spacing. Now, we're talking about very low frequency, ultra low frequency, so forth, through the power lines up above the ground. Now, I think, electromagnetically, there's a connection between the two and so forth. When we get an earthquake next to it, there's some kind of interaction. The interaction point where two waves cross is called a scalar. The point where the waves cross is the scalar area. It's a geometry term. Now, people talk about scalar waves Waves can come out of an area where other waves cross. Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden talking about scalar and crossing of uh, microwaves, for instance, to create an area of excited electrons at a distance, action at a distance, he called it, and using microwaves to create a scalar wave, which is a separate vibrating plasma, basically, out at a distance where the waves cross. Think of like scuffing your feet across the carpet and then that builds up at a distance and it builds up into a, a glowing plasma that then discharges in the atmosphere, okay? So using two crossed waves, interferometry, you can get a third effect where they cross is the principle of scalar waves and Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden. So now we're talking about, instead of microwaves, we're talking about ultra-low frequency. Instead of very tightly spaced waves, real tight together, Long, low bandwidth. Think about low bandwidth that you use for communicating for the Internet. Okay, so that long, low wave frequency going through those power lines and Mother Earth has it going down through the ground. And they're going in the same direction. Where they cross, we tend to see earthquakes break out next to these spots. Not just the lines, because you could tell me, oh, Dutch, and people do this. They're like, Dutch, there's power lines everywhere. I'm like, dude, shut up. We're not talking about blow, like power lines to your house. We're talking about huge transmission lines. But to seal the deal that it's really happening, they hit directly below power plants. They're earthquakes. Coal, natural gas, solar, wind, nuclear, nuclear. Below all of them. Serious earthquakes, too, not just small ones. Up to 5.9 we've seen down below the nuclear power plant. For, in, over in Virginia, rare, over here in Virginia, in Mineral Virginia, the Cuckoo Nuclear Power Plant at Lake Anna Nuclear Power Plant. Your 5.9 earthquake? Yeah, right next to your nuke plant. And it's happened all over the world this way. Over in Netherlands, your earthquake next to your, your decommissioned nuclear power plant, supposedly. 
over in Japan next to Fukushima. Just the list goes on and on and on. So earthquakes next to power plants, power lines. Why? Very low frequency. It's the only explanation I can come up with. Discharge into the ground. Electricity goes to ground, does it not? What's ground? Well, the ground. But this amount of power we're talking about, millions of watts or more, hundreds of thousands of watts going down into the crust. Guess what else is millions or billions of watts going through the crust? That wave that I'm talking about. And it drops off the earthquakes along the way. That wave is what causes the earthquakes. It's a big discovery of mine that there's the, the force that causes earthquakes, that precipitates earthquakes, is some kind of very low frequency that's passing through the whole planet and traveling around like a river flowing through the fault zones and the plate boundaries, the red lines that I've been showing you this whole update. So I'm taking the time to explain this in detail because I want people to understand just just at a core level, like if you go back and watch this video and listen to it over and over again, if you really want to learn, you will eventually understand what I'm talking about here, about a wave, very low frequency, spreading out, equally spaced, dropping off the same sized earthquakes all the way along a, an entire distance of you know 10,000 miles, for instance, here, or 8,000 miles of 5.2s going all the way up the coast. Well, what is that? 5.2s and 5.3s, and the biggest is in the middle. Well, it's almost like a kerplunk in a lake where you have the biggest in the middle and then a spreading out ripple in all directions. But then that means there's a big ripple in the middle coming from somewhere. The kerplunk. And the kerplunk are the deep earthquakes. So if you think about throwing something into a pond and it goes kerplunk and then it makes a big wave and it spreads out and dissipates out across a distance, in this case... The wave that's spreading out spreads out across the whole planet. And it doesn't lose much size. It's staying and maintaining its momentum across a huge distance. And then by the time it reaches the other side of the planet, it maybe takes a step down. So there is loss, but the loss that's happening takes a planet's wide distance to travel before it takes a step down. And it takes a step down by the time it gets to our lunar exit. But if it's a big enough push the wave goes back through or around and comes back out with new deep earthquakes like a relay runner effect if the push is big enough. This is all powered by the sun sending charged particles to the North Pole, South Pole. The solar storms and the glowing air, the northern lights, those charged particles, electrical energy captured in the upper atmosphere and ionosphere gets taken to ground too. And guess what's ground, really? The core, the core of the earth is the ultimate electrical ground, the plasma torch at the center of the earth. It's not a solid ball of metal or molten. It's plasma. Plasma like a plasma torch or lightning. And it reflects like a solid. So if the waves bounce off of it. Hey, did you guys know this little fun fact? Seismic waves... And shock waves from explosions in the atmosphere, like from a bomb, can be reflected the shock wave that would blow a truck over or... Now, it doesn't stop the flying shrapnel, but that can be stopped by lightning. An electrical arc. Boeing patented it. Now... There we go, 2050, well, here we go. Here's the diagram from the patent that they, oh, well, the Boeing force field. Yeah, this, this is, here we go, what is this, Wired? Wired's got it. Do they have the actual, they don't have the actual diagram on here. Hold on, let me get a picture of it. This is from the patent. This is the Boeing patent. Simply put, here's the Humvee. Here are the two transmitters. The transmitters are projecting out an actual lightning bolt the lightning bolt makes a connection from either the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top and it makes an arc of lightning the arc of lightning reflects the shock wave doesn't stop the flying shrapnel but the actual shock wave that would blow the truck over and cause all that impact damage on the truck 
gets reflected away by the arc, the electrical arc. So lightning bolts reflect shock waves. Very low frequency. What's lightning? Lightning's electricity. What's electricity? Very low frequency. It also will work on buildings, and I think it'll work to reflect actual seismic waves in the ground to stop it from hitting buildings. They haven't thought of that yet. That's my own invention. By the way, I'm documenting that here now in this video, so if anybody tries to take it, I'll sue your ass. But it is a good idea, right? Why not do that in the ground to reflect seismic waves? Since seismic waves and shock waves are the exact same thing, pretty much. So why not put an electrical arc generator where they would normally put those uh, hydraulic absorbers, <laughs> the shock absorbers that they put on the underside of buildings that don't really do too much to help or you know, have a withstanding limit? Why not reflect the seismic wave by putting an electrical arc generator all the way around the base of the building? And when the earthquake comes in, it reflects off the shock wave. Shock wave reflects off, goes somewhere else. It doesn't absorb it and make it go away. It reflects it and sends it somewhere else. So I guess your neighbor would be pissed. Anyway, what does that prove? Well, it proves to you that very low frequency can be reflected. And it's a wave. And it's a wave that can be reflected. And a shock wave can be reflected using very low frequency. And if that's the case, that makes sense with the power stations and the earthquakes down below them, doesn't it? I had to tie this all together myself with 12 years of plasma physics research being a high school graduate. Oh, yeah, I'm not a college grad. No, 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 no. Oh, I flunked out. First... First semester, flunked out of horticulture. <laughs> How ironic. If you know my story now, check out my Instagram if you get a chance. Okay, anyway, guys, word up, much love. Do you have an earthquake plan? Did I cover the rest of the planet? No, I didn't. Hold on. My God, this update's going to be another magnum opus. It's going to go on for 20 hours. Now, the good news for you is I don't have the European earthquake feed turned on. Otherwise, I could talk for 20 hours on Europe alone. But let's just quickly sum this up. 4.9 to 5.0 heading out across the Indian Ocean. 4.5 heading out across over into Afghanistan. What's down here? What do these two earthquakes have in common? Anybody know? Class? What do these two earthquakes have in common? Well, aside from their size, their magnitudes. Let me show you. We're going over to the Indo-Australian plate boundary. Up here. And down here. Now, USGS still has this one marked. They don't have the one from last night marked up here at Afghanistan. But if they did, you would see they're parallel to one another on the western side of the Indo-Australian plate. The rest of our big amount of movement has been going on from Indonesia over towards Fiji, down towards New Zealand, up towards Japan, up towards Kamchatka, very low frequency spacing on the wave, by the way, spreading out towards Kamchatka. So if we're moving over on the west side, that means the wave is spreading out to the west side. It's very simple logic. If we're moving on the north side and we're moving on the east side and there's a wave spreading and it's spreading over this way to the west, then we'll move on the west side. And we'll move on the west side about the same size that we're moving everywhere else. So where are we now? We're at 4.9 to 4, 4.5, 4.4, and 4.9. At the pinnacle sides. Pinnacle sides of what? Pinnacle sides here of the Indo-Australian plate, here of the Indo-Australian plate, and here of the Indo-Australian plate. We've reached the edge with some shifting. The wave has let us know it spread out to the pinnacle tip here, here and here on all sides. So something's getting ready to happen here. Just like what's happening here. So I would expect a huge outbreak of fives to take place in between these sets of fours. So now we can look in between them. What's the halfway point between this 4.4 and this 4.5? The number seven Carlsberg number seven shaped Carlsberg Ridge that goes into South Iran and South Pakistan. Spot number one to watch. Spot number two to watch. Over here, Madagascar. Go, actually, hold on. Mayotte Island to Madagascar. But I'll look at Mayotte at the arrow. Even though that's technically not the middle. The middle's right there if we do as the crow flies. 
but we got the big arrow here. This means Africa is going to be in the mix this week. Big earthquake activity due in Africa. Two spots, one, two, in between, right? Going back around over on this side is not immune either. This side, this puts northwest Sumatra in the mix. And the biggest of the bunch should strike here because this is going to be coming out and going over to the west. I mean, it already is. The plate is starting to shift, but this is going to be filled in by the biggest of the bunch. I'll put it at the next magnitude higher, which puts us at a new warning I have to issue now for up to 6.9 to strike in western Indonesia. If we're at 5.9 in Japan and we're looking for a 7 up north of Japan, stands to reason this should be in the upper 6 range. I hope I'm wrong and nothing hits, but come on. It'll be like a big star of earthquakes here. When this gets filled in, it literally will be. You can do the connect the dots of a star-like shape where this spot gets filled in with a big earthquake. And then you've got five points all the way around it. But anyway, all, all this is saying is that this whole thing is moving and it's now moving on the west side. It's already moving on the north side. We already know that. Japan already talked about it. And over to the west we go. The wave. Over to the west we go. Now, it focuses back in on western Iran and Turkey, where we have another 4.5, and then we take a step down once we get into Turkey. So the 4.5 is in Iran on the tip of the arrow. Look. Look. What's in Iran at the tip of the arrow? The red line again, guys. You're going to get so tired. If you're a long-time viewer, you'll get so tired of me talking about this red line crap. But the red line is the river, the way that flows. So we're going to take the next step up here, which means 5.5 is due, plus all the other fives that are going to be around it. We shouldn't be shocked if Turkey gets hit with a new 5.5 over here to the east, back on the east side of the Anatolian Fault. As we go further over to the west, I'll have to issue a warning after Turkey. So I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I'm thinking it's we're going to be going back up into Bosnia. So Italy already moved. Italy your earthquake warning. Wait, hold on. How many more days do we have to go? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, the warning expires for Italy. There was a deep 5.1 in Italy nine days ago. And we issued a 10-day watch for Italy to be on watch for six. So until tomorrow expires, I'm not going to issue any new, new warnings. But I'm already going to tell you, coming forward this week, we're going to watch here where the arrow is. But till tomorrow... Italy's still on watch for that 6.1. That's just based on the last round of movement. Iceland, let's go ahead and warn Iceland. Take a look at it. You're sitting there with two sets of quakes, 4.9 on one side, 4.6 on the other. Boom in the middle, obvious. Again, if you were to just do it as a crow flies, straight line between the two. But we go around the bend of the plate there, and it's still obvious. What size? 5.5. It's going to be 5.5s across the board once we get over here. So it should be 5.5, 5.5, 5.5, 5.5. And then the biggest of the bunch should be that 6 in Italy by tomorrow. Aziz, guys, check it out. Look, a new 4.5 to 4.6 came rolling in from the northwest. And every time we see, or almost every time, we see 4 point something activity here. We look down to Kangaroo Island in the southeast down here. Melbourne, Sydney, along the coast, but mainly Kangaroo Island, Adelaide, and watch for within the same magnitude. So new 4.0 level activity is going to be coming down here. Should shake things up, get your attention. New 4.5 coming in from the northwest means new 4 down to the southeast. Don't rule out activity all the way around the outside edge of Australia as well. That includes Perth, Sydney, up in the northeast. What is that? Queensland? I'm, I'm actually remembering. Queensland. Up in Queensland, and then over to the west, over by Exmouth, by the very low frequency array. Here where the U.S. Navy and Australian Navy have that big hexagon-shaped array. Texas, I'm going to tell you now, I'm sorry, you did not get your expected five this past week. The warning expired yesterday for that. Today is day eight of a seven-day watch. However, I already showed you the rest of the plate is moving, and I'm three days behind in California, which means three days behind everywhere else. 
So I'm not canceling the warning for Texas, but it didn't hit by day seven, which was yesterday. Same with uh, Oklahoma. So Texas and Oklahoma, we're not canceling the warnings. It looks like I'm three days off, which means it's coming. Five in Texas and a four in Oklahoma due imminently. So let's recap going back to the start because this is the part that matters. The big earthquakes. Look, we're flirting around with the potential of big earthquake activity in Japan. And I've already got a warning going north of Japan from this past week. Just coincidentally, right? Coincidence, right? We're also looking for the potential of one of the largest earthquake earthquakes on the planet in like a decade to strike here possibly by the end of this 7 to 10 day time period and we're 4 days in on a 10 day watch it could go up to 8.5 I hope I'm wrong I hope I'm wrong on all of it hope 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 for the best plan for the worst planning for the worst means watching the earthquakes flow watching them go along the edge of the craton or go around the plate there is a flow to this. There's a, it's like a trajectory or a train. You can watch it go from point to point to point over the course of days and weeks, but usually days. The solar activity is what throws a wild card into the mix. We have to watch for incoming solar storms, strong solar wind from open coronal holes, as well as filament ruptures, coronal mass ejections that are Earth-directed, as well as solar flares that also happen, which are Earth-directed. The charge particles with solar wind really does a number, and solar wind on its own, scuffing its feet across the carpet of the atmosphere, causes the aurora borealis, that electrical charge that goes down to ground. And then we get our deep quakes, then the whole process starts. You start seeing a bunch of deep quakes like this, Earth starts looking like a pin cushion on here, you know to expect shallower, larger earthquakes. And the more of these you see, the more you know it's going to be a doozy of a ride. And if you hear about a solar storm hitting and northern lights coming down to the United States, for instance, you know that's a lot of electricity that's going to go into the ground. And ground is the core. But when it goes into the core, guess what? It comes back out like this, hammering back up with very low frequency. The core is vibrating, in case you didn't know. The core is vibrating like a big bass drum speaker. And it's made of plasma, but it vibrates out very low frequency electrically induced okay final point on all of it you need to develop an emergency kit this is something you can do you can watch the quakes they are coming your way you develop your emergency kit and you make sure it's up to date you'll be way better off first of all knowing that something's coming your way i mean way better off than everybody else around you right they don't know you have to tell them about my updates and all my shutdowns and how controversial I am and all the stupid shit that comes up about me when you read online. You have to skip all that. And I mean, come on. So nobody knows yet about the spread. Everybody still thinks earthquakes are random. They were told earthquakes are random by the professionals. They're not. They're following a trajectory, a schedule, a time. And we can know the magnitudes based upon the size of the wave that's spreading out. And we can know the size of the wave based upon the size of the earthquakes that are spreading out. So we can know the coming magnitudes based upon the size of the current earthquakes that are being reported. It's not circular reasoning or logic here. That we can know from the data from the current earthquakes what is coming next based upon standing wave principles of propagating waves and reflecting back into themselves. So now that we understand what it is, there's some kind of standing wave of very low frequency spreading through the plates that removes the mystery of earthquakes and takes it into that forecastable realm. Now, we're not to the horse race yet level yet. We're not to the prediction, you know, where you can give the date and time and, you know, well, they can't even do that with the weather. Not even with visible weather can they tell us where a tornado is going to come down and hit, what town is going to get hit. They can't tell us a day beforehand what town's going to get hit. The only way we can know that is with directed energy weapons and harp rings. That goes into a whole nother discovery I made. In case you don't know, I am the discoverer of harp rings, which are radar pulses that have a storm effect. Big controversy over that. 
Okay, anyway, we're getting way off track, but actually not really. When you start talking about directed energy and very low frequency, we go all the way up into the high frequency spectrum, and the same principles apply, but we're talking about a smaller area. Okay? Anyway, 10.22 p.m. Central Time. You're going to develop that emergency kit. It's going to have a change of clothes, set of shoes, flashlight, batteries. First aid kit, sanitation, extra car keys, house keys, and ID. Medication if you need it. You'll be way better off than everybody else if you develop that kit and have it somewhere you can get it. And you may just grab it afterwards. Power might be out for a long time. You don't want to have to use your mobile device, your phone. Little puny little flashlight can't see two feet away from you. Why not have one in a bag ready to go? What else can you do? I mean... You could probably take the time to have food and water available. Food and water, long-term supply. That's a good idea to have anyways. Just in case, you know, anything else happens. All right. Enough lecturing. Saving this video. Putting it out on YouTube. Let me remind everybody who's watching on Twitch. You can come back and watch this later. So if you miss my updates live on Twitch, I know that's kind of a pain to know when I'm coming on. I never announce it. For good reason, right? Since I'm back on, finally, right? But we are going to go upload this to the YouTubes so you can watch it back later. And if you're watching on YouTube, thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing my information. It makes a huge difference if you share and if you like. I know a lot of people say, hey, hit the like button and all that. They do it before, before the video. If you liked this update, the full thorough explanations that I gave on each thing that I talked about, will you please hit the like button? It keeps my videos trending and gets them in the proper shape for people to see them. Otherwise, you never know what happens. I would also appreciate it if you shared the information. You can even just remember what I told you in this update for the big quakes, Japan and over at Solomon Islands and Vanuatu for the big quakes, the huge quakes, I mean. Then we talk about 6.9 to 7 over in Indonesia. That's big. They do get 7 somewhat, you know, a few times a year. Still, it's huge quake for them. So if you know anybody in Indonesia, Sumatra, Indonesia, you tell them 6.9 to 7 coming your way. That little bit of a difference could make a big difference for a lot of people. Uh, down in Southern California, you could tell the people down in Southern California, watch between the two sets of earthquakes down south next to the border and watch for a new upper foreign swarm to break out, enough to knock things off shelves. Down in Southern California, down by L.A., in the L.A. Basin. From the L.A. Basin south to the border. You can tell somebody in West Texas, hey, look, we're looking for a five to come rolling into Texas because fives already came into California and up in Alaska. It's flowing like a river from Alaska to California. It's coming to Texas next. And then over to the East Coast and out beyond. See, we're dealing with a spreading wave like this flowing like a river. Once you tell people that, they'd be like, well, if it's flooding like a river and it's flowing like a wave... Shouldn't we be able to watch it go from point to point? And you say, yep. We can know regions that are going to get hit as the wave goes through the region. And we can even know the magnitudes. And we can even know the spots down to a few hundred miles. Which is like the weather. It's better than the weather. It is almost, well, not almost. It is more accurate than hurricane forecasting. And less accurate than your daily weather forecast. We're somewhere in between your daily weather forecast accuracy, which is actually really good. Like, they get the weather tomorrow right, usually, right? And then your hurricane forecasts totally suck, and they have like 20 models that they have to pick from the day before. And that's all acceptable for everybody. Well, earthquake forecasting is definitely more accurate than hurricane forecasting. We can get it down to a 200-mile stretch and within a week. And it's less accurate than your daily weather. But someday, some egghead will refine the process of standing wave analysis. They'll install some very low-frequency antennas in the ground. And they'll be able to pick up the wave as it's coming in electrically and they'll see it on a spectro an electric spectro for viewing radio waves like you're viewing view, while you're like you're viewing and while you're viewing VLF 
but it's not in the atmosphere. You're going to install this VLF antenna the size of a shipping pallet down in the ground to detect this wave, future person who hears this broadcast. But I'm saving it so they can hear it in the future. Maybe it'll get archived and put in some deep underground vault to survive the reset. Hashtag Tartaria 2.0 reloaded. Stronger, faster, and better. Reset. Reloaded. All right. All right. You get a kick out of that? You guys like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Somebody asked me if I believe Earth is flat. I told them, oh, yeah, sure, sure. All the way around, bro. They looked at me puzzled. I said, do you know what? Planet X is flat. Planet X is so flat, you can't see it. It's that thin. Coming right at us, that's why you can't see it. (laughs) Ah, nerd laugh. Okay, all right, I am out of here. Okay, time to go. Peace out.